I just got this heat pump kit from Signature Solar. I'm going to install it out here in the garage. Now this does both heating and air conditioning, and I'm really excited to try it. Now the reason that I'm so excited about this particular model is because it says 38 sear. Now that is a little bit unbelievable. I mean, I've never heard of a heat pump having such a high sear rating before. Now the higher the number, the more efficient they should be operating. Now I, I'm really excited to put it in because currently I'm running a window AC out here in the garage to cool the garage. And that window AC is nine sear. And for heating the garage, I heat the garage with solar radiant floor most of the time, but sometimes I supplement that with electric resistance, which is just 100% uh, efficient or a COP of one. So any way that you look at this, it should decrease my energy use to condition this garage throughout the year. So we're gonna install it today. <laughs> It looks like we have the remote control. So plastic on this part that will face the room. So now let's look on the back side. Okay, this goes against the wall. Okay, so here's the mounting plate. The copper tubing is what's gonna carry the refrigerant. This is a condensate line. So when you're in air conditioning mode, you're gonna get some condensation. It's gonna drip off, and go into the condensate pan. You need to make sure that that goes out the condensate tube. So both tubes look good. I don't see any kinks or breaks in them. This larger one has a metal spring, which helps keep you from kinking it when you install it, which is great. The smaller one, uh, they omitted that. It looks like they bent this with a uh, tubing bender. I can feel the indentation of it. Now, I also noticed back here, it looks like there's a plug right here, and that might be part of the condensate tray because it looks like it's matched over on this side. It looks kind of like the same fitting. So I'm gonna check the manual. I might be able to take this uh, drain tube, and I might be able to move the drain tube from that side over to this side. And this is where the electrical runs in. Uh, so that would be cool if everything can be right here and just go straight out the wall. This is uh, kind of a cheesy back grate. The front grate over here looks fine. The back one is kind of uh, flimsy on here. This is uh, for condensate. Uh, Innovair, got our energy guide label. 38 sear, 15 heating season performance factor. Screw is way off. Let's keep turning. It looks like this is out of place. And this screw is off. So. I'm not sure about the, oh, we have a bit of a ding right there. Let me take the cover off and make sure that there's no damage to the fins or anything on the inside. Just popped the cover off. Let's take a look. Right here is where the kind of damaged corner was. Looks like we do. Looks like we have some damage, maybe shipping damage in there. So not necessarily going to cause a leak. Let's see if I can pry that off. Yeah. So you can see the refrigerant tubes running through the middle. And just for fun, I took out these two screws and let's look at the electronics inside. Now here's what the inside looks like. Now I am not an electrical engineer, so I don't know what most of these things are. I mean, a couple of things like capacitors I can name off, but most of this, I don't know what it is, but I like showing it for your benefit. A lot of you guys and gals are really good with this stuff. 
and can tell me, uh, hopefully, in the comments below, uh, if this is uh, well put together or not. Now, I just noticed over here that this looks like it was pulled off. Now, I haven't touched that, so let me just try to fish that back in, get that back in place pretty easily. So it looks like there's a metal clip. Hopefully that means we can pull off the tube. There we go. The way, like that. See? Mm -hmm. And I'm mocking up where I'm going to drill and mount everything. Now these are the refrigerant tubes and this is the condensate tube. So I put them together standing off from the head unit and I'm checking them with this piece of two inch PVC pipe. Now this is schedule 40 and it's actually a conduit for electrical, but same difference with any schedule 40 PVC. Now I can make it, but it's really tight down here at the very bottom uh, where that spring is and it's kind of a uh, difficult. So I'd have to be exactly on point with my measurements and get it exactly in the right spot. And I don't want to fight with it while I'm up on a ladder trying to hold this and get it in through the pipe. And by the way, the reason that I'm talking about pipes is that I want to sleeve the wall so that the insulation isn't exposed to the hole and I won't get the wind blowing in or, or critters coming in. Uh, so having a sleeve in the wall is a good idea. Now this one is a three inch PVC schedule 40. I'm measuring my particular pipe to eight and a quarter inches long, but you'll have to measure your own wall thickness to know how far to go for your application. And by the way, I'm doing all of this while on the grow watt inverters. It powers this saw just fine. So three inch PVC slides down nice and easy and I have a lot of play. So I could be plus or minus a quarter of an inch in my measurement and I won't have to fight with it while I'm up on the ladder trying to hold everything. Now this has an actual outside diameter of three and a half inches. So that's what I'm gonna have to actually drill it at. So the first thing I'm gonna do is measure down one foot from the ceiling and I'm gonna go eight inches over from the seam. And that way the whole head unit is mounted on this piece of plywood and not gonna, I'm not gonna drill through this stud. I noticed that I have a stud right here. So I'm gonna line up a couple of holes in the mounting bracket. There's some holes right here. So I'm gonna line those holes up with the middle of the stud so I make sure I get a couple of screws in that stud. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this side a quarter of an inch for the condensate to drain. Now that's not necessary. The manual actually says it can be level and that's because there's a port for the drain on each side. But since I moved that condensate to this side, I know that I can drain it to this side. we've got a decent drop over to this side, so it'll be a little bit lower. You can see that if I go up a little bit with that, about 3 16 or so, you can see that we have a little bit of a gap hiding in there now, which shows that this side is lower. So that's what we want. We're about to drill two holes through the wall, and Elena is gonna help me out by holding the shot back uh, that way all the sawdust gets caught in the shop back and I don't have to clean up later. One is going to be right here and that's for the condensate and the refrigerant line to go through. I'm also drilling a second hole up top. That's where I'm going to run through with a piece of conduit for the electrical wires. I'm going to run a home run wire back to my off-grid system electrical panel which is off in the other corner of the garage. So I'm going to run that 
across the ceiling later, but right now I'm gonna run through the wall just so I can put a piece of conduit. Uh, I have a long drill bit here. This is about a foot long drill bit, and I'm gonna put a little bit of a pitch on it going outside. Right there, that would be level. I came up at a little bit of a slope and then drilled through. Now I can finish this off with the hole saws inside here. I have a three and a half inch hole saw for the condensate. That's this big blue one. And I have a one and a quarter inch hole saw and that will be for the three quarter inch conduit to go through the wall. This is a three and a half inch diameter hole and that kind of fuzzy material that is uh, InsaWeb netting and that kind of got caught up in there. And then inside the hole, this is cellulose insulation. I dense packed this with a friend of mine and it's a prototype insulation. Uh, it was, it didn't actually come to market. They had some trouble with it, but you just kind of get your hand in there and push it out of the way. Now, unfortunately, right there, you can act. And once I push it out of the way with my hand, you can actually see the hole in there. Uh, now, that one worked out fine, and so did this hole, except when I took the plug out, I noticed that there is no insulation up there. And that was one of the troubles with this prototype insulation. I can't feel it. So it's at least settled a few inches. And so that's why they didn't bring this product to market. It didn't uh, hold its dense pack, unfortunately. Now I got the material for free because I was testing it for them and that was part of the deal. But I would love to come back at some point in the future and add some more density to these walls. Okay, so there's the window AC with the bird's nest. Gotta get rid of that. Actually, the whole thing's gonna come out. This is where the one and a quarter inch hole needs to be drilled. And down there is for the three and a half inch. So I brought the one and a quarter inch up with me right now. Here we go, the small hole. And there's the small hole drilled all the way through and the big one all the way through into the garage. See all the way through it. <laughs> so here's my piece of PVC pipe. and this hole is now flush at the top. It's coming out a little bit at the bottom and that's because I put a downward slope on it. Now it goes outside nicely to contain all the refrigerant lines and condensate. This is a piece of three quarter inch PVC conduit and I cut it long enough to go through the wall and give me plenty of play on the inside where I need to attach it to a box. So I'm gonna be using a just a junction box up in the ceiling, and this will be where I transition from the THHN, which will be inside the conduit, and I'll transition over to MC cable, where I run it across the ceiling and over to the circuit breaker box. So I'm going to glue on one of these fittings that have threads on one side onto the end of the PVC, and this will allow me to transition into the box through one of the knockouts. I just have some PVC cement, and this is gray, so it matches. <laughs> Up here is where I'm gonna put the PVC pipe through the wall. Then from the outside, I can attach the LB. This is the long piece of PVC conduit that I'm gonna run up vertically on the side of the building. So I'm going to attach the LB right now. Now here's what the LB looks like. Thank you. 
This is a disconnect for outside. This is the outside disconnect, and this is just some liquid tight. So it's going to go in here. So I bought the fitting for it. Um, Here's what's on the package, so you kind of know what I'm doing. So these come apart in pieces. There we go. So now that should be watertight. It's my understanding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now it's going to go in here. So I'm going to knock that out. And then this is where it enters. This is the part that's going to go to the compressor. I finished putting these wires in and then I realized I forgot to put this nut on here. So I got to take these wires off. <laughs> oh well, nothing like doing it twice. The head unit is still on the bench and I was checking out how this is wired and it kind of has to fish down through there and there's kind of an opening over there. I put a plastic bushing in this because it was just metal. And what I think I'm gonna do is actually put the wires in now while it's on the workbench. And that's probably wrong, but I just don't see that being very easy to fish through uh, when I'm trying to push the wire in from the outside. So I think it'll be easier to put the the power wire for the head unit on now. Okay. Now these are gonna get attached up here. And then there's a clamp that will clamp this wire in place. So just tighten down the screw and it will clamp down on that wire. Now, even if I pull from the back side, that can't go anywhere. And what I think I'll do is back here, yeah, see it pushed the bushing out of the way? So I'm gonna put a little zip tie around that. I need to attach the wires in here. They're labeled as N1, 2, 3, and ground. I've already attached the ground wire, and then I'm looking in here on the manual, page 33, we can see the wiring diagram, white, black, red. So that's what I'm gonna do is white, black, and red on these ones. 
white, black, red, green. It's a bus now. Driving the bus. <laughs> okay, it's our stop. We gotta get off the bus. Why? I'm going to pour a concrete base for the outside air conditioner to sit down on. So I picked up a 2x4 today, and 2x4s are really expensive now. I think this was $7, uh, which is quite a bit more than they used to be. Uh, so I'm just going to build a simple frame, and then we'll be able to pour the concrete in it.
vapor barrier is not really so much about water. I mean, who cares? It's outside. Uh, it's more to prevent the uh, wet concrete from kind of leaking down around the edge and getting more spillage because I bought two bags, which are over here, and the two bags should make just enough. I don't really have a lot of spare, so I just don't want to waste a lot of concrete uh, leaking. have any chicken wire or rebar this is the closest mesh I have to something that will help reinforce the concrete I'm going to put the cinder blocks on the wet concrete. It's had about 30 minutes to cure just a little bit, so it should be a little bit firmer. Hopefully the cinder blocks don't just sink in. <laughs> now this is to raise up the compressor unit uh, for snow. If you're in the south, you probably don't have to do this step, but I want to raise it up because the snowfall here can get really deep, and if it blocks the intake and outtake of the fan, it won't work well. really well these are nice and level across should be a really good base for the uh, mini split to sit on top of it uh, now typically if these were a foundation for a house you'd have them turned 90 degrees for the strength of them in this case I tipped them sideways now I did that because the weight of the feet are actually going to be right on top of these concrete bars so there is a direct pathway down in compression so it's fine uh, but also if I tipped them, then water would get in there, water will freeze, and these will break apart. And I've seen this happen. It does happen here in New England where if these are sitting on the ground, water gets in them, they just break apart after one winter. Stripped 
it's ready to go. When I drilled these two holes up here for the electrical and the refrigerant lines, I measured them off based on the width of this box, but I didn't take into account the elbow and joint there. So that was a mistake on my part. So now when the refrigerant lines come straight down plumb, they would hit this box. They'd, they'd come down about halfway on it, hitting the box. And I don't want to do that. So I could just skew them off at a little bit of an angle, uh, but it would look weird. So instead, I'm going to do it and do it a third time, I guess. But I'll, I'll unscrew these wires, pull them back up, I'll cut it right here, and then I, I bought a new elbow, we'll put a new elbow on, and I'll move this electrical box over to the side. <laughs> that way it'll look better when it's finally done. This is called the line set. We have a quarter inch copper tube and a half inch copper tube, and these came with this particular kit. Not all kits come with the line set, this one did. Uh, so these come with flare fittings already on the end. And I bought this, uh, it's called Nylog, and it's a kind of a, like a sealant that you can use on flare fittings, and it's compatible with R410A. And what first thing I gotta do is take this plug out. Now there's no pressure or anything inside this particular line. It's just there to keep uh, any debris or anything getting inside the line set. There go. So the plug just pops out like that. And now we have the flare fitting on the inside. So here's the nylog. And the nylog can just go on this edge right there. And So not very much of it. These refrigerant lines are coming out from the indoor head unit. And there's a... Hear that? That's nitrogen. They pressurize the inside one with nitrogen. It's not refrigerant. The tip of this flare here can get a little bit of nylog on it as well. Page 32 of the manual gives a torque setting for these different flare connections. And it says for a half inch, we want between 33 and 40 uh, foot pounds. This is the torque wrench I have. It is a 3 8 inch drive torque wrench. And I'm going to set it here to the 33, which is the minimum. So there's 33 foot pounds. Okay. So it's 15 sixteenths. Okay, so that was the first one, the first click. And we're right in between the torque settings now at 37. Okay, there's the second one. So now that's torqued down. That's one tube down. Now I'm gonna go up and do the second one. The second one is a quarter inch, so it's gonna have a different torque setting. Again, I'm gonna to refer to the manual and I'm going to tighten it up to the lowest, back it off a little bit, then bring it up a little bit higher and torque it down for the last time.
this foot on the outside unit is bent. It was damaged in shipping. Uh, so I'm just gonna grab a wrench and try to bend this back. Yeah. All right, so that looks decent. I have the unit positioned where I want it. So I'm just gonna try to mark the four feet location. Now, I could string an extension cord around the garage, but I have the Blue Eddy, so let's see if it can run my hammer drill. We're at 90, 96% state of charge on this. This is my hammer drill. I have a 3 16th inch diameter uh, carbide tip bit on this. tube is coming down the wall and then it needs to tie in to these valves down here so I've bent it it I bent the tube into the position that I think makes it line up well with the the valve so if you look at it straight on see, I think it's lined up pretty well right there I just want this out of my way That's out of my way. And now I can get in here. Mark it. So if the copper pipe is pushed up against the wall. Inside here, there's going to be a burr, and you can deburr it with this tool, which works like this, or you can also get this other type. All right, so I have the nut off. I can put the nut on. Now we need to flare that. I'm not sure what it is about this particular copper pipe but I've checked and double checked and triple checked it and it is not um, exactly the right size. So here's a little piece of emery cloth on it with the flaring tool. If I put the flaring tool on, now I can get the, um, the right distance. There we go. This type of flaring tool uh, has an eccentric cone on it. So the cone is kind of offset. So we need the cone loose. And we need this part loose. And we need to check the manual for how far it wants out. When you put this big steel block around the tube, it's not flush. You want it proud just a little bit like that. And then it'll work better. No. All right, let's take a look. It's 
the next morning and I switched to long sleeves and pants because the mosquitoes are so bad but it's gonna be about 90 degrees Fahrenheit today and so I'm already sweating but it's first thing in the morning and let's get this uh, pressure tested and hooked up now please remember I'm just a DIYer I'm not a professional but uh, I'll show you what I'm going to be doing to vacuum and pressure test this system so this is a vacuum pump and gauge set that I purchased on Amazon and it came as a package so you get both for one SKU and I'll leave the link for that in the description below I just thought it made things easier uh, so we need to vacuum the system now vacuuming out the line set is to remove any moisture that might be in there uh, just humidity and moisture in the air that might have gotten in the lines because they're not sealed or pressured so the lines have some amount of moisture in them and that will turn to an acid if it mixes with the R410A. Oh, it looks like they gave me a bag in here. <laughs> uh, let's see, well, we have some oil, vacuum pump oil. The pump itself, so this is labeled as a one stage, uh, 3.6 CFM, 0 0.8 Pascals, and this particular one is uh, 110 volt. The gauge set comes with some hoses. Uh, let's see here, a hook. The gauge set has a high and low side. And the set comes with two brass adapters. So these look like they have a Schrader valve built into them, which is kind of like a a valve that only opens when you depress it with a pin, uh, kind of like your bicycle uh, wheel or kind of like the tire on your car. All right, well, I'm going to check the instructions out. I'll add the oil to the pump, get everything uh, set up, and we'll come back after that. On the side of the mini split, there are two valves, the quarter inch tube and the uh, half inch tube. The half inch tube is called the low pressure side, and this is where we're going to connect up the gauge set. So here's the gauge set. I have the red line running over into the tank of nitrogen. I've got the yellow line going over here into the vacuum pump, which I filled with oil. Okay, the oil in there. And then the blue side coming off the gauge, this is what we're gonna hook up to here. Now, I don't know if this will hook up directly or if we're gonna need an adapter for it. Yeah, so it is pulling a vacuum. When I do this, I can, I can hear the noise from the valve and I can feel it. So it is trying to pull a vacuum from here. All right, so the vacuum pump is running and we are pulling down a vacuum. Now I think if I was to stop this, let's see if I was to close this off, we might not have a full vacuum in the line set. Now the instructions say to pull a vacuum to, uh, what was it? So let's try shutting this off and see what happens here. I'm switching the yellow line over to the mini split. I'm doing that to do the nitrogen pressure test. So the pressure in the tank right now is at 1500 PSI. Like I mentioned, I'm borrowing this from a friend. So he's used it before. On, on the label on the side here, it says design pressure on the high side is 550 PSI. And design pressure on the low side is 240 PSI. I have the pressure tank hooked up and the mini split is now on the yellow line going in. It says here, got 200 PSI right now. So as I tighten this, the pressure goes up. Oh, 
And over here is the information. So right now I have it up to 240 PSI. I'm gonna spray it down with some leak detection fluid. Everything looked good at 240 PSI, so I'm gonna boost this up more to 500 PSI. So I'll keep turning this regulator on the nitrogen tank. Okay, so as I turn this in clockwise, the pressure's going up. And we can also see that over on this gauge. So bringing the system up to pressure. All right, so that seems to be about the max I can get out of this. I'm gonna turn this off. All right, so I can't seem to get this past about 350 PSI before all the pressure's coming out of this thing. So, well, I noticed that my pressure was dropping on this gauge and I wasn't understanding why. And so I phoned a friend and basically I had turned off this knob, which means that I was reading pressure dropping just in this hose to the regulator. So the regulator was slowly leaking out the pressure uh, because I had this knob off which goes to the tank so I wasn't actually reading the mini split so I have to switch my red and yellow hoses that way when I shut this valve off this gauge is reading the red hose so I need the red hose on the mini split so my bad I mean I was I was soaping everything up trying to find where the leak was and I wasn't finding any bubbles so <laughs> turns out I had the the lines wrong it has been about two and a half hours since I hooked up the hoses the correct way and pressurized the line set. And I'm pleased to say that it's still holding at 410 PSI. The needle hasn't moved at all. So that makes me feel so much better. So I can take this off and we'll hook up the vacuum pump again. The vacuum pump has been running for over half an hour. We have negative 30 PSI and we're ready to close it down. So I'm gonna close the valve over here first. Now I can turn off the vacuum pump. Now that I ran the vacuum pump for over half an hour, I've disconnected the vacuum pump uh, with this knob shut off. So these, uh, the red and yellow hoses are not connected to anything. Only the blue hose is still connected to the outdoor unit. Now, if I was to disconnect this uh, blue hose right now, then the system's under vacuum. It could suck some moisture in. So I took off the dust cover, and inside here is gonna be a little uh, valve. I need to open that. We'll crack it open just a little bit. We'll get some pressure in the gauge set here. So I, I just cracked it just a tiny bit right there, and our pressure is increasing. So I'm just letting it go up real slow here. I don't want to don't want to rush it, you know, and hurt anything. All right, we're up at 100 psi. Okay. So I'm going to close that now. We're a little over 100 psi. At this point, I can take off the valve. So I'm going to do this uh, as quickly as I can, and a little bit of refrigerant will leak out but at least that will make sure that we don't suck the moisture and uh, humidity into the system. There we go. All right, so that's off. So now that that is done, I can put this bottom cover back on the Schrader valve. And this is just a dust cap, so it doesn't have to be tight. There we go, so just snug and now we can finish opening this up and I can hear it moving through there and snug it 
all the way open. Now I can put this dust cover on. Take the upper dust cover off. Go. And open this one. It's also five millimeter. And dust cover back on. Wow, that feels good. System was vacuumed, pressurized, vacuumed again, and now the refrigerant is released. This outside unit comes pre-pressurized. Uh, now according to the manual, it comes pressurized with enough refrigerant for up to 29 feet of a uh, line set. Uh, now you can uh, go up to, I think it's like 49 feet of line set if you uh, add more refrigerant than what's already in this. Uh, but it comes pre-charged for up to 29 feet. In this case, it just came with uh, about 10 feet, uh, three meters, uh, 9.8 whatever feet worth of copper line set. And I only had to cut off about 10 inches uh, in order to get it to come in here perfectly. <laughs> I'm installing some flexible conduit. Uh, this is called FlexTite. It's up here in the disconnect box and now I'm gonna run it over to this part on the outside condenser unit. I've also attached a weather tight strain relief over here, and that's for this cord which goes up to the head unit. the wires pulled through here. These three wires are gonna to attach to the bottom and the top ones will go up to the head unit. I also have a strain relief that will go around this wire to the head unit. And the wires go through the flex tight into the service disconnect box. Okay, I just finished the wiring inside here. Now this wire goes up to the indoor head unit uh, and it follows up along the side of the wall. And then these wires are THHN and they're coming out of the conduit and going to the bottom screw terminals. Now this is fed with 240 volts only. There is no neutral, but there is four wires that lead up to the indoor head unit. So there's a secondary one, which in this case is the black wire and it, it feeds whatever communications or something I don't know, but uh, that is uh, going to the indoor head unit. Now I wired this based on the manual, uh, which is page 34 and then in really fine print <laughs> down there it tells me the order to to wire them in so i think i got that correct i'm gonna put the cover on and it just uh goes on like that here's the outside service disconnect and i'm all done wiring it up you can see there's two reds going to these two terminals and then two blacks to those two terminals and now we have this little handle that goes in here now you see, it just makes an electrical connection between the two. There's no fuses or anything. This is a 60 amp rated disconnect. So it jumps from here to here, and then separately from here to here. So we'll just put that in, and that'll make an electrical connection. So, let's see if I get that in. There we go. It's tight because it's brand new, but now we are making an electrical connection between these two sides and between these two sides. And now that outside box is done. So now we've got all the wiring done out here. All the refrigerant is done out here. And now we just need to go wire in the circuit breaker box. And then I can come out here and dress these up with a line set cover. Well, I'm up on this ladder, uh, up by the ceiling of the garage near the head unit. This is where I ran that four inch by four inch junction box. I need to finish running a wire all the way over to the inverters. I've knocked out this hole and I've prepped a wire for it. And the wire that I'm using, this is called MC or metal clad. This particular wire is called 14-2, meaning it's 14 gauge uh, copper wire. There we are. 
So we have 14 gauge copper wire. We have we have a black, white, and green for ground. I've already put this little attachment on the end. And that's going to just snap right into the box. So let's do that now. And now it won't pull out. It's holding that in securely. Now these wires I need to connect up together. This AC load center is just for the off-grid system. Uh, there is a transfer switch inside the house where I can transfer between the grid and this off-grid system. Typically, I run it off-grid. Uh, right now, I switched us to the grid inside the house so that we can shut this down so I can put a new circuit breaker in here. So at this point, let's go ahead and turn the, we're gonna turn the inverters off. I'm also gonna turn off the solar switches. And I can turn off these circuit breakers in here. All right, so all the circuit breakers are off. We're completely off at this point. And so let's just verify that we don't have any more voltage. So this is AC, and we'll be over here. And I've got nothing, zero volts. And up here on this one, Again, zero volts. All right. Uh, just because these displays are on, that's simply because it's still connected to the battery, uh, but it should shut off as soon as it finishes cooling itself off. The fans are still running because it was charging the batteries. But we have no voltage at the AC load center. Now this MC wire, or metal clad wire coming down, this is what is running across the ceiling of the garage over to that four inch by four inch junction box and then eventually tying to the conduit outside, service disconnect and powering the AC. So now we're going to cut this and wire it in. Now they do make a really nifty tool for cutting MC or metal clad. Uh, it kind of looks like a can opener. I don't own that tool so I'm just going to use this little uh, cutoff wheel on this rotary tool, and I bought this one from Harbor Freight, but this is similar to the brand name Dremel. So what I'm gonna do is get a measurement here. I'm gonna come in through the top, and I need to make sure that I can get over to the grounding bus bar, the neutral, and this circuit breaker. So I wanna make sure that I can reach, which I can, so I'm gonna cut it here. That's my mark, and I'm just going to finish cutting it down lower. There we go. Now it's just that quick. I didn't even have to cut it very deep at all. There was still a little bit of aluminum. This cladding is aluminum. A little bit of the cladding still uh, holding together, but you just twist it and it snaps off gives you the rest of this. Now I need to grab one of the little red plastic inserts. There's these little red plastic uh, sleeves or bushings. They go around the wire and then slide up inside of the metal cladding. Now it will prevent the metal cladding from nicking the wires. There's no sharp edges. Now I can take off the plastic. I pull the plastic back. We'll just feed this in. And you still need that little red bushing, which is still there. And then it just uh, snaps in, hopefully. There we go. And now it won't pull off when you tug on it. It stays in place. Now we can feed this down through. There 
we go, snapped in. I'm untwisting the wires. All right, now I'm gonna pop out this 50 amp breaker that I don't need. We're gonna put in a 15 amp. 15 amp was, 15 amp is what you use with 14 gauge wire, and it's also in the manual for the mini split. 15 amp is the maximum uh, for the mini split. Even though it says usually the mini split will only draw three amps and at most six amps, but the highest it says in the manual that you can put an overcurrent protection device on is 15. Now it doesn't actually need a neutral. So if you wanted to run this mini split off of one of these inverters without the auto transformer, you could. That's kind of cool. We are wired up here. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, so I think I actually want to try running it without the auto transformer uh, at first, just to try. Uh, so let's go ahead and switch these on. I'm switching on the PV. And we'll turn on both of these circuit breakers. So we're feeding the panel. Uh, now it's not on yet. These inverters are just doing their boot right now. And down here on this one, it's telling us that we have 240 volts and zero watts. Now, these don't light up without the neutral because they're tied to single legs. But now let's go ahead and actually turn on the mini split. I heard the mini split click. I just heard it click on. The mini split came with a remote and it also came with some batteries. So I'm gonna put, put these together. Here's the remote control. And right now we have fan on auto and I changed it to cooling mode, which is that snowflake and 61 degrees Fahrenheit. This unit's been running about a minute. And if we check the temperature around it, you can see 64, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And now if we go over here and look inside, <laughs> 33, 32, oh, 31, we're below freezing. Oh, and it just clicked, clicked up the fan speed. So that's great. So it recognized that we were below freezing and oh, sped up the fan. 12, 10. <laughs> Look at that. Four degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> All right. At four degrees Fahrenheit, you could get icing. So it'll have an automatic defrost, but that's also why it kicked up the fan speed. It kept the fan speed really low until the internal coil got below freezing. And we caught that in real time. And then it sped up the fan. That was so cool. So I won't need that little AC anymore. <laughs> so that is great that it's blowing out nice cold air. Uh, let's go over to the inverters and find out how many watts it's drawing to do this. The fan speed isn't high right now, so it should be drawing its maximum amount. So here's how much that air conditioner is drawing. About 800 watts, 3.5 amps. Beautiful. Well, it's been about 24 hours of running the mini split and it is nice and cool in here. 24 hours ago, the high was 72 degrees Fahrenheit and now it's uh, 63 degrees Fahrenheit and we did hit 61. A little bit ago, I changed the setting on the mini split up to 64 degrees. And now, look at that. It's kind of maintaining around 300 watts. So that's the cool thing about that inverter-driven technology. It's, uh, it's changing the amount of electricity that it's using just to maintain the temperature in the garage. We are now 48 hours later, and the mini split is keeping this garage at 63 degrees Fahrenheit. It's actually set to 64, so there's a little bit of fluctuation and we're only using 131 watts to maintain that temperature. Oh, that is a beautiful thing to see. That is so efficient, wow. I'm thrilled, I'm very excited. Uh, it's neat that now I have the air conditioner uh, or really the heater too for the building on just this dedicated load center. So now even if the house is on the grid, I can still be operating the climate control for this building off the grid on these inverters. And I don't even need the auto transformer 
for it. It can run on these inverters directly. And because it's a soft start, uh, I don't have to worry about uh, surge capacity with this. Uh, it ramps up real slow. Part of why this is so exciting is, let's say you're running your whole house on a dedicated six, eight, 10 kilowatt inverter. Uh, and the inverter won't allow for paralleling more inverters, but you want to increase your capacity. What you could do is move your mini splits or add mini splits to replace your current heating system or cooling system and move that onto a dedicated loads panel being supplied by just one of these. It could still feed off of the same battery bank that you already have if, if it's a 48 volt battery bank, but now you have the ability to add more solar. Uh, you can move those loads off of your main center and that increases your overall inverting capacity uh, without you needing to kind of totally ditch your existing inverter. Uh, so that would be if you have a grow watt, one of the low frequency ones that don't allow paralleling, or you have an Ames, uh, like I used to have a six kilowatt Ames that fed the building. Uh, and so this is now an option of being able to move those things off of that. And you don't even need the auto transformer for it. So it's some fun stuff that you can do with that. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, uh, something that you'd like to see in a follow-up video, please leave those in the comments below. Uh, and that way, maybe in a one month, I can do a follow-up and let everybody know how it's still running. Uh, and I'll address any of your questions in that. So thank you everybody. Please like the video, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already.